This is Statement Piece, the podcast. My name's Sita. And my name's Sophie. Welcome to the new era of the podcast, where we talk about everything from Nepo babies to middle school fashion nightmares. Stay tuned. Today we're going to talk about a topic that is very almost core to fashion. There's a lot of debate around it in regards to the timelessness of this product, but also the quality, the craftsmanship, and and most specifically, the cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, today we're going to be talking about Birkin bags, if you haven't already guessed. And it's um, it's a pretty famous um, bag. Sita, can you describe to our readers what um, a Birkin bag looks like? Sure. So to give some backstory, the Birkin bag comes from Hermes, which is a French uh, design house that is specialized in leather goods. They started off with equestrian goods and then kind of moved towards more leather handbags and whatnot. So the Birkin was actually founded because there was an Hermes executive sitting on a plane. And coincidentally, this is very folklore, coincidentally, Jane Birkin was sitting on a flight from Paris to London right right next to the executive and she was complaining that she couldn't find a suitable bag for all of her needs as a mother but also just you know a busy woman needing a weekender bag then literally during the flight the bag was sketched and that started the Birkin bag so it's actually made of what they call their heritage leather and what's unique about it is that all of their heritage leathers are dyed by vegetables and they have either like smooth or patina, um, but mostly you'll see that the bags are in a grained pebble leather. It's very simple looking in construction. It has very clean lines. It has a top handle and then a little buckle with its iconic lock. It's also important to note that Jane Birkin is a French actress and style icon. When you think like French girls, classic style, you're usually like, well, Jane Birkin is one of the reference points along with Bridget Bardot. And as you were getting at Sita, you know, all the bags are relatively expensive, though there's not a range in that sense. There is, at an expensive tier, there is a range of prices for Birkin bags. Um, which can vary depending on, you know, the kind of hardware you get and and the kind of um, material they make it out of. And the bags have a limited release each year. So obviously that kind of exclusivity is really important for the brand and defining it as like a luxury item. Sita, this is such a hallmark and such a staple of fashion and fashion iconography. Like Anyone who really like knows about fashion, like it's one of the rudimentary things. You have to know what a Birkin bag looks like, even if you can't ever afford one <laughs> in many, many lifetimes of working. So how did you first become aware of the mythical Birkin bag? That's a great question. I think my first memory of the Birkin bag, I was watching The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, which is a Disney channel show that features uh, the Sprouts twins. And there's this character on the show called London Tipton. And she had this bag that basically was never identified as an Hermes Birkin bag. But as an adult, the characteristics of the bag that they talked about was basically that. And then I think it came up again. I was watching this murder mystery show called Castle. There was an episode basically about how this individual was murdered and somehow they were able to trace back to the murderer because each Birkin bag has a specific serial number. And that serial number corresponds with the person who purchased the bag. Mm -hmm. And then from there, just being knowledgeable of what happens in fashion, I feel like that's... And also, especially in the luxury handbag world, this is kind of the goal item that everyone looks forward to having. I think for me, I know that I went to a very ritzy lower and middle school in New York City. And there was a girl, I think, who actually had a Birkin bag, not in my year, but... um several years above me. And the only reason why I know this is because she brought her Birkin bag into the nurse's office while I was there and <laughs> absolutely freaked out. At that point, I must've been like maybe 10 or 11 years old. So I had no idea why the nurse was freaking out uh, so much about the specific bag. It was honestly weird to me why any student would ever bring a purse to school at all let alone a really expensive one. You know, later on, I ended up watching 
Gilmore Girls, I think a little later in middle school. And there's a scene where one of the main characters, Rory, gets a gift from her uh, very rich boyfriend, Logan, and it's a Birkin bag. And she goes to her already rich grandma and she shows her this bag and the grandma freaks out and goes, it's not a bag, it's a Birkin. And I think, you know, that said a lot to me that it was something that even really wealthy people like this grandma would be, you know, impressed with. And, you know, in my middle school, kids showed up in, you know, some blingy stuff sometimes. And you now you have to imagine the nurse had seen a lot of stuff. Uh, but even this was like an extra mile. So it definitely imprinted on me that this is like transcended. This is at a new level of luxury that it was not not normal. I think that's the thing. It it then kind of evolved for me after just watching fashion and being more interested in it, seeing which individuals actually carried a Birkin bag. And I think before it was very kind of classic, iconic actresses or models such as Jane Birkin. But then now it's definitely evolved to almost a status symbol in pop culture where you see a lot of music artists and a-list celebrities like the kardashians having multiple or closet full of birkins mm -hmm. and they may not use all of them but it's almost like a collectible some people attribute it attribute the uh, rise of the birkin is located happening in around the 90s and because it was seen as a uh, not just being about style but what it sort of signified and that was specifically referenced in a sex in the city episode the kind of overwhelming popularity and the growth of the knowledge and the notoriety of the bag is obviously reflected in its price in 1984 the cost was two thousand dollars for a bag which is already like pretty crazy expensive. Even if you are interested in fashion, you already have to be a certain income bracket. But even then, it has increased 500% with one going for half a million dollars. And that was because it specifically had a, it was crocodile Himalaya leather, and it had an 18 karat white gold and diamond hardware uh, with the lock alone being worth $80,000. Yeah, because of that, you know, the resale for handbags. And because more and more people, you know, want to get it, the higher the price point, you know, the more status it has. So in a way that ex exclusivity has actually like worked for it rather than against it. In this case, a bag hunter, a resale site for ha handbags says that the annual return on a Birkin bag was about 14.2% compared to the S&P average of 8.7% in a, a year and gold, which is, which has decreased like minus 1.5% per year. So in summation, that's a lot of figures, but it's basically the headline is even if you pay like a ton of money for a Birkin bag, you can still actually make a profit on it if you decide to resell it. And I feel like that's like the classic trope of husband and wife, like the wife is trying to convince her husband to get them a Birkin bag as a good investment, similarly to a high-end watch or a luxury car. This is something that won't depreciate as much as other goods and you can get a return on your investment and we'll talk about who are the people who are making that investment and why that's so important next but we'll be right back <laughs> And we're back. Awesome. Yeah. And so right now we're going to be talking about how the Birkin bag has really become a cultural phenomenon, who's buying them and why is it important. I think what's interesting about the Birkin bag is that, yeah, it's a bag and it was kind of created, as you said earlier, Sita, out of wanting it to be an actually for, for really accessible utilitarian reasons, wanting a nice kind of luxury weekender bag. But obviously, if you're going to drop like over $10,000 on a bag. Like, is that really something you want to be carrying around and like throwing leaky pens in or whatever? I know you um, have a thing with, uh, is it Mary-Kate or Ashley Olsen? In there? It's Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen. Yes. Yes. Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen. I will talk about them later, but I do think they have been icons carrying around the Birkin and not a very traditional way. For people like me who thinks like if I had like a, you know, a $60,000 bag, I would be, you know, guarding it with my life and never ever using it, you know, for a lot of people, even though they've made this investment, you know, they, they don't want to like sell it right away. So it is something that you buy and you keep. And then obviously that question of always like, like, you know, do you want to 
risk that value going down. It's not to, uh, you know, pardon the pun, but there's a lot of baggage that comes with actually like owning uh, this bag. So there's a luxury fashion consultant and brand strategist named Robert Burke, and he calls the Birkin bag a rite of passage, that it's more than just a status symbol. It's that you've kind of arrived at this upper echelon of the wealthy and the wealthy that are interested and knowledgeable about what's going on in the fashion world. It's interesting because I think before it was definitely more so a low-key secret that people knew about, especially because it had such limited supply. But now it's very in demand and I feel like it's almost become legendary in today's pop culture. For example, Migos has rapped about the bag. They have a song called Birkin. And like Sophie had mentioned earlier, there's the classic sex in the city scene, which has become a very common meme stating that it's not a bag, it's a Birkin. And even Drake is known for collecting Birkins, which he has once told the Hollywood reporter for the woman that I end up with. And last is just another example, which I think is hilarious, is Chris Jenner has a separate closet for Birkins with a neon sign that says, need money for Birkins. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so as you can see in today's society, there's a lot of it's definitely becoming uh, something more than that. Definitely. But I think, you know, there's the popular understanding of the Birkin and I think kind of the secrets out in a way about Birkins as this status symbol where now I think it's signaling to everyone exactly who you are and what you're you're kind of aiming for. But I think that, you know, one of the things that I find really interesting is that Birkins, unlike a Holmes art, very much not cheap, but it's not something class to another in terms of like, it's not something, this isn't something that a middle-class mom, like a soccer mom would invest in if she wanted to be able to one day like send her kids to college, because you obviously have to already be at a certain level. And so I sometimes still see it even as like a sign of a class starting a sign that you can, you can afford for the Birkin, the sign that you're investing in something luxurious, but also, you know, as we've mentioned before, it's sleek, it's simple, but it's sort of does speak to this old money kind of idea that wealth whispers and old money people don't go for like the flashy stuff. It feels like it's at a fork in the road where you're right, like there are people who are, you know, Jeffree Star and James Charles uh, wearing Birkins and they're certainly you know, very far from old money. And there's this phenomenon of whenever a TikToker or an influencer gets involved in a something high fashion, like the Met Gala, I think people, like there's always like this sort of like a uh, highbrow fashion panic that those people are, will cheapen that thing. You know, I know that you uh, know a lot about the Sita, but um, in addition to like conveying status and exclusivity, the process to getting a Birkin, especially outside of like the resale market, which I think might also be changing things. If you're going to go the direct route and traditional route, you know, having a Birkin also has connotations with your association with Hermes, right? Yeah, it's so interesting because I feel like Hermes really tests their customer loyalty through being able to ascertain a Birkin bag. So how it kind of works is that you work directly with a sales associate at Hermes and you have an account there and it basically records every single time you've made a purchase, how much you've purchased, what you've purchased. And through that relationship with your sales associate, you can kind of discuss what you may be interested in, whether that maybe an Hermes Birkin or a Kelly and maybe what leather or hardware it may be. And so through that, after you've made a large amount of purchases, I don't know if there's a point system or if there's a specific monetary value someone has to meet, then the sales associate will usually bring you to a back room and unveil a Birkin. And usually it's I've heard that you usually have to accept it that day. Otherwise, it may harden the chances of you getting uh, proposed a Birkin in the future. So you may not even like it for all that matters, but it's usually expected to get it. So usually it takes quite a few purchases just to even get to that point, which I think is almost very smart on Hermes's part in that not anyone can walk down the street with a Birkin. They want people who have been loyal to the brand and I guess who they know will represent the brand in a way that they want to, knowing that they have been, as you had mentioned, Sophie, this kind of old money heritage, very timeless French fashion house. I think that people can obviously speculate the 
kinds of people that they, you know, these fashion brands might see as like best representing them and that, you know, it can be quite exclusionary. Usually people who are old money are white, you know, they come from a certain like type of family background. Um, yeah, like very waspy, I think is the very best way to put it. Totally. And I know of one famous incident, although it's kind of disputed, I believe this was in 2005, Oprah Winfrey went to an Hermes shop and she was apparently not allowed in. In one report describing the incident, which was denied by both sides, they say Hermes staff members at the door failed to recognize her because she wasn't in full makeup and hair and that someone uh, basically made a, a microaggressive comment that the Hermes store had been having a problem with North Africans lately. Some People say uh, Winfrey arrived just after the store had closed. And according to the, uh, the Washington Post, an unnamed friend told the Daily News that while they don't label the incident or didn't explicitly label the incident as racism, they said if, you know, if she were a comparably famous white woman, they named like Celine Dion or Barbara Streisand, that there wouldn't have been a problem and they probably would have acquiesced to that and like you know given her special treatment so there's there's definitely a debate about what was going on but I think you know based off of this article I read and the internet kind of reacting to this moment people really seem to it seemed to resonate that in a lot of the times in these high fashion spaces you know people of color people who don't fit a very particular mold of physical beauty they are often like uh, pushed aside or discounted um, or not even given access to that space and those things. And I think that that kind of, if you don't have anything else to add, Sita kind of very much leads us into how the values of the Birkin bag are kind of gelling or don't gel with the values of our time right now, which we'll discuss in the next segment. <laughs> And um, we're back and we're going to kind of talk about the Birkenbag's future in uh, the fashion space, especially given how fast fashion and the values um, in these, you know, high fashion spaces are being challenged. So Sita, what do you think about uh, the Birkenbag's future and what do you see for it? Great question. Well, I think after the pandemic, we've noticeably seen a shift in fashion from maximalism and a lot of consumer goods to vintage and being able to resell things and trying to be more sustainable and also having knowledge about how the item that you're investing in may impact the workers who either made it or the fabrics or materials where it comes from, there is definitely a drive to learn more about these uh, facets of of what you may be buying. And I think with the ambiguity of where the Hermes Birkin comes from, like I do know that it is made of some of the rarest skins and some of the most high-end hardware, but that doesn't really resonate with everyone. And you're actually seeing that in pop culture, which is the craziest part. So Beyonce actually had a song that denounced Birkin bags. In Renaissance, I think. Her yeah, like- in summer, in summer Renaissance. And the final track of it basically had a lot of different fashion houses in it, but specifically burned the Birkin bag and highlighted the Telfar bag, which has definitely gained notoriety more recently. Yeah. So Telfar is a unisex fashion line run by Telfar Clemens, who uh, won the CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund in 2017. And since then, it has become one of the buzziest brands. And they have a shopping bag, which is kind of like a roomy tote with straps. And similarly to Hermes, has a very limited supply. However, the price point for some of these bags are way more accessible even the way to acquire these bags and it's online and you can sign up for the release dates similarly to how some street fashion brands have released collections anyone can access these so they're available in black tan white dark olive oxblood and they range from sizes small to large 
and prices vary, but the most expensive bag is $240, while the cheapest is priced at $140. And I believe it's also made of a vegan leather. So all of those facets that I was talking about that I feel like Gen Z specifically is focusing on is highlighted in the Telfar bag. But more than that, it's obviously backed up by Beyonce. Yeah, yeah. And you know, that's the thing is like Beyonce can wear anything. So the fact that she's choosing Telfar, Telfar is a black owned brand is huge. And I think there will always be a market for people who really just like want the thing that's exclusive because it's exclusive. Right. And Birkins aren't necessarily going to be swayed by the opinions of the masses. Like it won't be dependent on that because it's not for the masses. But at the same time, there are these very visible select group of people, you know, especially like the influencers who really care about how other people perceive them. And I think that, you know, especially with wealth inequality, the fact that people who are in Gen Z and even like young millennials can't afford to buy homes even or even pay off their student loans you know to see someone drop like sixty thousand dollars on a bag sort of unrelatable that these people like influencer influencers who are in this business of being relatable you know i think that that could be a real detriment and i you know there was even one quote from an influencer where they said tell far it uh global is the new Birkin bag. It's like kind of like what you're getting at with Beyonce. It's like a replacement. It's like, and it's also a value exchange of like, we're, we're going to choose something that's more equitable. So Solange Knowles, Beyonce's sister, actually dubbed the Telfar bag the Bushwick Birkin. So there definitely is a little bit of that parallel there that I think a lot of people are noticing. Uh, one of the things that I think this one TikToker, I think her name's Mandy Lee, was saying is that, you know, she forecasts is going to become popular is not having like a thousand different Birkins that you only wear once. And I think that, I think it's just a really interesting thing to watch. Just give. So Mary Kate and Ashley, the iconic twin sisters who were child actresses, I think in their late uh, or their late teens, early twenties, when they were at NYU. And even after that, they uh, would run around New York City with their Birkin bags completely beaten up, using them as a tote as one would. And it has all of its scratches and you can just see that the leather is not as structured. Like there's a little bit of looseness and movement with it, which I love. Like, But also it is an investment. Like you are getting your, your return on investment in a different way. Although it's interesting, like with Mary-Kate and Ashley, I feel like once Mary Kate and Ashley own a bag, like the price will go up in and of itself. Like they themselves are uh, part of like upping the price and an investment. And they're probably, you know, they're probably at the status of they don't even think of it probably as an investment, which is, you know, in some ways, you know, the casualness of that is just another sign of like cool and uh, status in a kind of backwards way because you you don't you don't care that this is a sixty thousand dollar bag that mm -hmm. is now completely you know messed up that's so interesting and I think it's just it's interesting to consider you know how a lot of these you know big fashion staples are going to be kind of reinvented you know by new generations who are growing up in a completely different kind of fashion market and um I you know to kind of wrap up I wanted to ask Sita because I'm very curious, what uh, would you ever, if you had the money, would you spend it on a Birkin? Um, I think if I had the money, I don't think I would spend it. But if someone just happened to gift me a Birkin bag, I would mm -hmm. accept it. Yeah. <laughs> Like I do see a lot of fashion as collectible, similarly to collecting watches or art. And with that, I also have like a very timeless kind of classic sense of fashion with a little bit of an edge, which is why I love like Mary Kay and Ashley Olsen. Like I feel like they kind of, yes, they kind of embody that as well. So with that, I I would, I would, if if I had the chance to, I would. But with anything, I think it's important just to be aware of what it may mean and what the connotation may mean. I think if I had one, I would be very like conscious about wearing it around and where I would wear it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think even if hypothetically I like won a billion dollars like tomorrow and could spend it on whatever I want, I don't know that I would that I would get um, a Birkin or that it would necessarily be at the top of my list of of things to do. 
although I can see why some people would want to get it, especially, you know, if, you know, or for someone who can really benefit from having that in status. You know, I think a lot about um, this past season of Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, where mm -hmm. um, Garcelle Bouvet, who is the only Black cast member, like there was kind of like a story arc where she, about her getting her first Birkin, like she had a Birkin bag, um, birthday cake, and then at the end, basically like a champagne and Birkin party, where you went and you like bought um, these like resale uh, Birkin bags um, and she ended up getting one and it was you know I think one of the things that she uh, talked about in that season was her stepping into uh, you know this new uh, kind of level of lifestyle that she was able to gift herself and her kids that she wasn't able to have as as a child and I think that we can judge it and obviously but like I think it can really matter to people who you know really feel like that kind of solidifies them and and validates you know uh, a certain class status that I think many people might assume that they might not have and so uh, but personally I feel like I'm definitely more in the camp of like Birkins are kind of they're kind of out they're kind of over all right yeah do you think do you think there is a future for the Birkin bag one of the things I found interesting is that there seemed to be murmurs or it wasn't exactly clear where the book Birkin bag stood right now that there were some reports that they were making more than um you know even in a small scale they were outstripping demand or making more of them and that uh there were these rumors of multiple year-long waiting lists to get these Birkins and that those waiting lists were actually a myth. I think that that's really uh, interesting, you know, to consider obviously how much this facade is so, sort of necessary and this air of mystery. And I think we're living in a time now where things are becoming less and less, like mystery is so much hard, so hard to have in the current climate that like, I don't know. I think there will always be an audience for it, but I don't think it's gonna be kind of that it bag it's not a bag it's a Birkin yeah no I can I completely agree like I feel like there will always be a part of society that will always look for these goods you know there is like collectible luxury good market for a reason and oftentimes Birkin bags are actually auctioned off at major auction houses such as Christie's or Sotheby's specifically rare ones but I thought it was interesting that Hermes in the next year are actually going to build three new factories and onboard 400 more artisans and usually the bags take like 15 hours to make so adding a lot more artisan will eventually add more supply and I thought that was kind of interesting in that are they expecting more or is the demand going up or is it just like what you said the wait isn't as long and that may just be a myth yeah I mean, who knows? And that's like the fun, the fun thing about this is I feel like it really could go many different ways. And obviously it's not, none of this stuff's going to happen tomorrow, but it's going to be, I think, whether the moment that we're experiencing with, you know, fashion and sustainability really being at this sort of pitch, how long that lasts, you know, I hope that it's a permanent value set that stays, but like things can change wildly and the zeitgeist can change really wildly so who knows but it's so cool to talk about definitely well to our audience keep your eyes peeled let's see what happens as time goes by and if anyone wants to donate a birkin i'm available all right well thank you everyone for listening i hope you enjoyed and we'll see you soon see ya bye bye